After eight years, China's Minister of Defense will once again appear on the stage of the Shangri-La Dialogue, communicating the view of the Chinese military. While trade tensions are escalating between China and the United States, how shall we review the two nations' military ties? After the constructive reform and fast development, what will be the role of China's PLA on the global stage? And how will China face the concerns of other nations towards the rise of the armed forces? Today, I'm very happy to have Senior Colonel Zhou Bo in our studio. He is the Director of a Security Cooperation in the Office for International Military Cooperation of China's National Defense Ministry. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Welcome to Dialogue, Senior Colonel. Many expect the conference not to have a, senior, uh, a big prizes. Uh, we can unfold our discussion later on, but uh, what generates the headlines this time around in Shangri-La Dialogue uh, might be the participation of the Chinese PLA delegation. Since eight years ago, uh, our Minister of Defense, Mr. Wei Fenghe, will attend the summit. What do you think of the background? Well, uh, indeed, this is a good question because uh, it's one of the most frequently asked questions as to why China hasn't been sending uh, high-level delegations. Well, actually, ever since the beginning of Shangri-La Dialogue, starting from 2002, China has been sending delegations to attend, although at different levels. But uh, I believe uh, this has uh, something to do with the wish of the world and the wish of China because uh, with the increasing strength of China, uh, people do need to uh, listen to a higher voice, a greater voice of China. And it is also the wish of the Chinese side to have its opinions and views better viewed and aired and listened. Uh, so it's not exactly uh, the seniority of the Chinese delegation that would decide the importance that we are attached to this uh, dialogue, but we're happy to let the world know that uh, this time uh, we have, have great importance attached to this uh, summit and we hope and pray that uh, our voice will be listened carefully. I'm afraid, without exceptions, uh, the U.S. Secretary of Defense will be invited to deliver a keynote presentation at the very first preliminary session of the Shangri-La Security Dialogue each year. Uh, what do you think would be the major concerns of the American delegation if we were to hear uh, their presentation at the plenary? Well, I think uh, uh, Pentagon has already announced uh, uh, somehow about what he's going to say. Essentially, it's about uh, uh, the American Indo-Pacific concept or strategy. It depends on how they actually describe it. Uh, and clearly, in their program, it is uh, already mentioned by S that he's going to talk about Indo-Pacific. So that would be his focus. Very quickly, Senior Colonel, what is the concept and what is the background against which this concept of Indo-Pacific strategy was introduced? Uh, actually, uh, this concept is uh, everybody's concern since it was uh, voiced because uh, first, the first question is, what is it? Is it a concept or is it a strategy? Is it inclusive or is it exclusive? And uh, what is uh, its relationship uh, taking account of the alliance system in the region and taking account of that something, taking account, uh, for example, ASEAN centrality that everybody, including China and uh, US, agreed to? And because the region is much wider, uh, which incorporates two oceans, so where is the focus? Is it because of China or is it against China? And would the other three uh, countries, India, Australia, and Japan, necessarily follow the United States uh, in forging the uh, uh, same uh, objective against anyone or for some reasons? So this is everybody's question. Uh, let's listen to how he would say. But at least at the last year's Shangri-La dialogue, uh, Indian Prime Minister Modi made it clear that uh, the Indo-Pacific is a natural region and this concept has to be open and inclusive. And the Chinese delegation welcome his comment. Many Chinese observers are clearly aware of the role of neutrality that the Indian government plays since the Doklam crisis, particularly after the Wuhan summit between President Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Modi. Having said this, one of the major issues on the agenda between the two sides, Chinese and American, will be the South China Sea. Uh, do you think? Uh, waters there remain turbulent 
and what are the issues of uh, greater concerns, not only for the U.S., China, but also for ASEAN. Uh, some of the claimants, of course, come from ASEAN. Well, you have uh, really asked a lot of questions. In terms of an uh, uh, intermilitary relationship between China and the United States, I think currently we must uh, try our best to make this relationship more stable. Because in the past, the people used to consider the economy between the two countries is called the so-called ballast. But uh, right now, we are having a, a trade war between the two countries. So, and uh, right now, the United States uh, is attacking China on high uh, technological front. So the military relationship, because of the sensitivity and because of the gravity, certainly is uh, equally important, if not more important. For at least a couple of times, uh, warships from the two navies uh, did have a very, very close encounters, very dangerous ones. And therefore, many people are wondering aloud if there is a regular hotline dispute settlement mechanism between the two militaries to avoid having a head-on collision. Yes, we have all kinds of mechanism. Uh, in terms of hotline, uh, what we call it is a direct uh, communication link, which uh, uh, was established uh, as early as uh, uh, 2008, but in 2015, it was further improved to make it a kind of video telephonic link. So that means when I talk to you, I can read into your eyes. So this kind of a mechanism is well placed there. Uh, plus some other mechanisms, such as in 2015, the two militaries have signed a rule of behavior during unplanned maritime and air encounters, and also mutual notification of major military activities, plus a lot of uh, uh, dialogues and forums to make sure this uh, relationship would not be derailed. I believe the Chinese side must have done a lot of homework to make sure who Mr. Patrick Shanahan, the makeshift Secretary of Defense is, and what kind of personality he represents. In our negotiations, we got to know what the partner uh, uh, likes and dislikes. So are there any differences between uh, James Mattis, the former Secretary of Defense, and this, uh, uh, this current one uh, in terms of uh, personality and their way of thinking in handling the male-to-male -male ties between the Chinese and the American sides. Mm, I, I can't comment on the character of the acting American Secretary of Defense since I, I haven't uh, seen him. I would uh, probably have a better answer to your question when I see him. But in terms of uh, his uh, uh, former predecessor, uh, I think he's a straightforward man. He's, uh, he's uh, always straightforward, but he's also friendly. In fact, uh, at his departure, the Chinese spokesman of, from the Ministry of Defense uh, give uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, credit to him. At the shangri Security Dialogue, I believe uh, the most avid observer would be the regional bloc of ASEAN. Uh, there will be uh, keen observers to follow the development on major issues. So what are uh, major concerns of uh, the 10 member states of ASEAN concerning security cooperation in this particular region? I think, first of all, they think about their own role in the region because uh, they have uh, put forward ASEAN centrality, which was first endorsed by China and then by other major powers, including the United States. So with this kind of Indo-Pacific conflict, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy or concept, uh, could ASEAN still be in the center? I have some doubts because even geographically speaking, ASEAN's location would not be in the center if we put the two oceans together. Uh, you can argue it safe, uh, with safety that it is in the center of the Pacific, but if we put the in Indo-Pacific together, how can it be in the center? So th uh, this is the first question. And then with the, uh, the rivalry or competition between China and the U.S., these countries uh, are very much worried uh, about the, the worsening situation because uh, although the United States has made it clear that they do not have a position on the sovereignty of South China Sea, but uh, they actually have uh, stepped up the funnel of operation, which actually makes the situation more tense. And right now, China and ASEAN is negotiating a code of conduct uh, in the South China Sea, and our uh, Premier Li Keqiang has uh, pledged last year that uh, this uh, uh, COC would be finished within three years. So right now, we're seeing a very interesting situation that the United States, who pledged not to have a position on this issue, actually 
has become the main actor with ASEAN watching uh, anxiously. That is uh, uh, something unexpected for the ASEAN. Senior Colonel, it seems China's diplomacy in the South China Sea has been pretty successful if you look at the very constructive attitude of President Duterte of the Philippines uh, who agrees to engage China in a security dialogue and therefore the bilateral relationship between Manila and Beijing has improved uh, dramatically over the recent years. However, with the uh, sharp change in the American attitude, um, the Trump administration towards South China Sea geopolitically, do you think the Manila government is coming under huge pressure and there would be changes as a result in their uh, negotiations with China on the South China Sea? Uh, I hope not, because China's attitude toward the uh, uh, Philippine government is uh, quite clear. Uh, with the previous government, we have some problem because they sued us uh, at the International Tribunal. But uh, President Duterte's uh, interaction with China is very positive. And uh, you, 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 I give you an example. Even in the city of Marawi, uh, China's uh, assistance of, uh, of conventional weapons or small arms actually have played a huge role in that we have uh, provided President Duterte uh, 6,000 rifles and one of the precision sniper. Uh, is re has reported uh, killed the head of uh, the Islamic uh, terrorist. So what has uh, the Filipino government paid? They paid nothing for this. They just uh, have showed uh, uh, their sincerity and uh, rapprochement to toward China, and they benefit from that. China has asked nothing, and we give this kind of assistance to them for free. You are watching dialogue with Zhou Bo, uh, who is in charge of the... Uh uh, security cooperation in the Office of, uh, for International and Military Cooperation of China's National Defense Ministry. We are discussing what would be major issues on the agenda of the Shangri-La Security Dialogue, particularly the prospects of the male-to-male -male ties with the Pentagon. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Senior Colonel. A lot of the international observers have been holding their breath about the military build-up of the PLA uh, in recent decades. The naval build-up especially uh, generates, uh, generates a lot of uh, front-page stories. Uh, therefore, it has delivered a huge impact upon particularly the Trump administration. Can you brief us on the implications of China's uh, Blue Water Navy? Well, uh, that is uh, a question very much uh, talked about because uh, when you mention about China's Blue Water Navy, it's interesting for me because I believe that as early as 500 years ago, China has the only blue water navy in the world. That is the, uh, the China's treasure boat fleet led by Admiral Zheng Ho. Uh, but right now, since the uh, beginning of counterparacy in the uh, Gulf of Aden, China has indeed built its navy into a blue water navy. Sometime, nowadays, well, uh, because uh, China is the only country that has sent uh, flotillas unstopped to the Gulf of Aden, and sometimes uh, uh, one single voyage could last 300 days. That means uh, after the mission in the Gulf of Aden, they would st still sail around the, uh, the all corners of the world to be familiarized with the uncharted water. So the Chinese Navy is becoming a blue water navy, and China has built more and more ships uh, at a speed uh, that is really awesome uh, for the observers. So, uh, it's interesting for me to, to note that the Chinese Navy actually is the least uh, combat tested services compared with the PLA ground force and the PLA air force. But uh, why? The Chinese Navy seems to be at the front. It's driven uh, by two factors. One is China's ever-growing uh, overseas interest, which is huge, and then the associated international responsibility for the major power. So these two factors have driven the Chinese Navy to the forefront of China in the image of the world. Are you suggesting quietly that while China says we deliver, we deliver kind of international public service and public products in international waters, such as the uh, uh, Gulf of Eden, uh, the United States, however, says uh, uh, we would protect freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight in the South China Sea. Do you see any sharp contrasts, or there could be some overlapping in terms of uh, our interna international missions? Uh, for example, China is uh, uh, one of the P5s that provides the biggest number of uh, blue helmet uh, troops uh, for 
uh, peacekeeping. Uh, is that still the case? Yeah, that, that is uh, very much still the case. Uh, in terms of peacekeeping, China is the largest uh, troop contributor out of P5, and China is the second financial contributor uh, of the uh, uh, all UN uh, nations. But uh, if we compare Chinese armed forces with uh, uh, American armed forces, there are so many aspects. Uh, let me put, uh, try to stress one. Why can't we just cooperate in the freedom of navigation? Because freedom of navigation actually is, is the core concept of UN Convention of Law of the Sea. Uh, China and uh, the United States both agree to this concept. It's not that one country disagree with this concept and one country agree uh, to this concept. Both China and the United States agree to uh, freedom of navigation, but they interpreted it in different uh, manner. But uh, look at the example in the Gulf of Aden. Uh, this is a kind of a, a joint efforts to protect the international ceiling. And it's also joint efforts for freedom of navigation. And it's also counter piracy. So we cannot change the law, but we can have flexible interpretation of the international law. And if you look at the, uh, the future, Chinese armed forces will definitely become stronger and stronger. And, but China has no ambition to police the world. So that uh, would make its PLA more uh, responsive to what we call the non-traditional threats. So if you look at what the PLA is doing overseas, none of this uh, is uh, uh, debatable or controversial because uh, be it uh, peacekeeping, be it counter piracy, be it disaster relief or evacuation of uh, uh, non-combat uh, personnel, they are all welcomed by the rest of the world. So China doesn't have uh, an ambition to control the so-called choke points or have the so-called uh, Mahinian uh, decisive battle with any countries at sea. Perhaps the core issue, Senior Colonel, is a chronic issue of mistrust between the two militaries and between the two governments. And do you think the so-called innocent passage in the uh, sovereign waters of the Chinese islands in the South China Sea will likely cause a head-on collision, direct confrontation between the two militaries in the future? No, either passage, either passage, passage is allowed <coughs> by uh, international law subject to uh, the arrangements of uh, individual countries. Uh, in the case of China, China uh, would ask for approval for, of the Chinese government should uh, foreign military vessels uh, enter into China, China's territorial water. But China is not the only country that have such regulations. Let me give you some examples. For example, India. India does talk about freedom of navigation, but sometimes I, I would just wonder what they are referring to, because if you compare India's law with China's law, India's law seems to be much more strict even than China's. For example, for any countries to conduct military exercises in the exclusive economic zone of India, which involves ammunition and explosive. They have to ask for consent of the Indian government. I'm not talking about territorial waters. I'm talking about the exclusive economic zone. But China doesn't have such regulations. Yeah. Look, let's look at the security concerns in other areas. For example, uh, fighting terrorism and extremism in Central Asia. What do you think of the role that SEO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, has played in ensuring peace and stability in this heartland of the Eurasian continent? Well, uh, the, the role of Shanghai Cooperation Organization includes, but is not limited to, this, the so-called three evils. But it's very much the focus because it's even written in the charter of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, so far, I believe that all these countries are making efforts in that all the exercises are done within Shanghai Cooperation Organization are held in the name of counterterrorism. And something uh, pos uh, positive is coming out. For example, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we have actually uh, established a kind of a counterterrorism center for information sharing. But this is a long-term task because uh, these uh, evils compared to major threats are more uh, scattered. They are not necessarily obvious. Therefore, it is more difficult uh, to tackle. But uh, given the large size, the sheer size uh, of uh, Shanghai corporatization, 
I would argue if uh, all these countries can make efforts to make the, the region within their own boundary safe and stable, then it's already a huge contribution toward the peace and stability of the world. Despite the intensive discussions, if not debates, policy debates between the Pentagon and the White House on the military drawdown in both Syria and Afghanistan, um, uh, the Chinese stand ready. The Chinese stand ready to assist with the post-war reconstruction. Can you tell us the role of PLA in maintaining peace uh, in these two countries? Well, uh, in terms of, uh, first of all, uh, with uh, countries in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, we always uh, have a very uh, positive attitude. And in terms of military relationship, China has provided uh, some uh, logistic assistance uh, uh, to Syrian government uh, a couple of years ago, uh, no, uh, I think about three or four years ago. Uh, in terms of our relationship with Afghanistan, because uh, again, Afghan is uh, one of our uh, neighbors, so we have a normal country-to-country uh, -country relationship, and also we have been providing them some kind of military assistance in terms of uh, training, for example. Lurking behind all these developments, Western observers uh, pay particular attention to the very special close strategic partnership between Moscow and Beijing. We both sides, Russians and Chinese, agree not to forge any military alliance. However, the powerful partnership between Moscow and Beijing does uh, keep the U.S. on the watch, keep the rest of the world on the watch as to what can be done jointly by the two militaries. Can you tell us more about the implications of what we call in Chinese Jiban不结盟. Well, yes, you have made it quite right that China and Russia, in spite of a close relationship, are not allies. And we have uh, uh, reiterated this, uh, both China and Russia uh, did. Uh, this relationship is close in that both countries share similar views about uh, multipolarization of the world. And in part, it's also driven by uh, common pressure uh, from the West, uh, I, I would say, yeah, it is a, a kind of a, a reason uh, we were driven uh, by a certain kind of common pressure. But uh, this relationship uh, won't uh, go beyond the uh, partnership uh, in that this is not in our interest and this is not in Russia's interest. So uh, we have uh, witnessed a very interesting relationship when the, t when the two countries are really close but are not, not necessarily allies. Many joint military maneuvers have been conducted by Moscow and Beijing in recent years. Uh, do you think these uh, uh, war games uh, target any third party? Uh, well, they would, uh, it's interesting because uh, <coughs> almost uh, all spokesmen of, on any military exercises won't say it is against uh, anybody. But it is true that uh, China and uh, Russia have almost conducted exercises on an annual basis because uh, uh, China actually uh, didn't have an uh, exercise with uh, any other countries before 2002, uh, but it's uh, after 2002, starting with Kyrgyzstan, we started the bilateral exercises with foreign countries, and then we have a multilateral exercise uh, with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and now a lot of uh, bilateral exercises with Russia. This uh, is interesting in that this is a, a kind of a institutionalized exercise, and with uh, each exercise, we seem to have found some new areas each time. For example, in the uh, joint naval exercise this year in Qingdao, both sides uh, have made joint efforts to rescue a submarine, a, a hypothetical submarine at uh, accident. Uh, this is a uh, highly technical demanding, and it shows the depths of our relationship. And China and Russia have also conducted two war, uh, computer-assisted war games for missile defense. This, of course, is not something tactical. It is strategic uh, cooperation. This shows the depths of our relationship. Uh, towards the end of this uh, very interesting program, Senior Colonel, uh, it seems that there, uh, both sides, Tokyo and, the, uh, and Beijing, have kick-started a process of rapprochement uh, following the alleged purchase of Diaoyu Islands back in 2011. Uh, do you think uh, 
uh, this relationship will, will benefit enormously from the momentum uh, uh, that will be shored up uh, during the summit meeting between uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and President Xi Jinping that will be taking place on the sidelines of the G20 in Japan this year round. Well, I think uh, as a result of the improving, uh, as a result of the improvement of, uh, of uh, the relationship at the state level, the intermilitary relationship has also uh, improved tremendously. Uh, for example, China and Japan signed uh, a mechanism to avoid uh, miscalculation in air and at sea uh, last year in 2018. The agreement itself is not uh, very long, but it took both sides 10 years. So with this kind of uh, mechanism in place, hopefully the situation around Diao Yanlan will be managed. Thank you very much, Senior Colonel, for being with us. That's the end of this edition of Dialogue, ahead of the opening of the Shangri-La Security Dialogue and Annual Security uh, Mechanism that is uh, most important following the Munich Security Conference in Europe. I'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye.